It was about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, while the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. When the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God and said, Certainly this man was innocent. And when all the crowds who had gathered there for this spectacle saw what had taken place, they returned home beating their breasts. But all his acquaintances, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jewish leaders, asked Pilate to take him away, to take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there.
Today's guest musicians are provided to us by the Rings and Ivy Sunday School class uh, in memory of their past members. And what a blessing um, that these musicians are to our worship today. So if you are in Rings and Ivy, thank you very much um, for just making this day even more glorious than what it already is. Now I invite you uh, to bow your head with me as we go to God in prayer. God of Easter joy, we welcome you this new day of life and promise. Pour your Holy Spirit upon us all and overtake us with your grace. We've come with eager anticipation to know you, to see you, to feel you, to hear you, and to have you touch us with your Holy Spirit from the top of our heads to the tip of our toes. Along with the women who were surprised at the tomb that first Easter morning, we also await being surprised at what you can do, what you will do through us for the sake of love. By the wondrous resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ, you forever locked away death and threw open the gates of everlasting life. We lift before you, Lord, those who are sick, who are lonely, who are hungry, who are without the warmth of compassion and companionship. We pray for people of all nations whose lands are engulfed in war. May we be resolute in proclaiming your liberating peace to the world. We pray also on this Easter morning for those who have given up on faith and for those who have yet experienced a vibrant life lived in your great love. Use us, O oh God, your Easter people, to help light the way for others, being examples of your amazing grace. Help us, Lord, to share our own living faith with boldness and humility to tell about our unique stories and how new life has been and is being born within because Jesus lives. Today is the day for elation to burst forth, for in Jesus Christ you make what is dead alive again. We thank you and we praise you and now lift to you the Lord's sacred words as we join with one voice in prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Please stand and join me in the prayer for illumination for Easter before you. Let us pray. Father of glory, by the raising of your Son, you have broken the chains of death and hell. Fill your church with faith and resurrection hope, and send your Spirit now to illuminate your holy word through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Today's reading is from the Gospel of Mark. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us? from the entrance to the tomb. When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised, he is not here. Look, there is this place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is the Gospel of the Lord. So there is an ancient Easter greeting that for me, if we don't do this, it's just not Easter. And some of you will know this, but it goes something like this. So I say, Christ is risen, and you respond, he is risen indeed. And then I say again, Christ is risen, and you respond with a little more enthusiasm, he is risen indeed. And then, and then the, the idea is we blow the roof off the place with an hallelujah at the end. Okay, you want to try it? That was the warm-up, by the way. I, I wasn't holding you to that one. Ready? Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. All right. So a growing number of people would call us fools uh, because we're here today. They'd call us irrational, even delusional, because we gather to celebrate Jesus and this ridiculous thing called resurrection, that a human being who died physically three days later got up from the grave. See, a growing number of people say they have no use for God or religion. Some will even say there is no God, no higher purpose, no meaning for life, uh, and that when this life is over, that's it. It's over. That, we are, that what we are experiencing is a strictly material thing, right? And again, so when life is over, when you take your last breath, that's it. A noted atheist by the name of Christopher Hitchens once said this, and he said it very confidently, I'm not afraid of being dead because there's nothing to be afraid of. I won't even know it. Uh, now, what I want us to know is as certain as Mr. Hitchens sounds about that, uh, as certain as a growing vo voice in our culture sounds about how all this religion and spirituality stuff is nonsense, uh, the truth is that Mr. Hitchens can't prove that death is an end any more than I can prove to you that it's not. And I'm being honest with you here, right? I can't prove it to you. Uh, when dealing with questions outside, or of life and death, uh, we move outside the realm of empirical knowledge and we move into a realm that you and I know as faith, right? But I, but I can't prove it to you. But here's what I want you to know. Neither can atheists prove to you there's no God. Neither can an atheist prove to you that there's no life uh, or that death is it, right? Uh, 
Now, with that said, there are some observable things that we can say about Jesus and about the resurrection. So uh, some of you will be familiar with a book by a man named Lee Strobel called The Case for Christ. How many of you have heard of that book? So it's, the book's getting a little old now. It was written in the uh, late 90s. Uh, but there was a, more, a movie that came out more recently in 2017 that kind of tells the story of Lee, Lee Strobel. So Strobel was an avowed atheist. Uh, he was a graduate of Yale Law School and was a, a legal affairs reporter for the Chicago Tribune. So this was a guy who knew how to look at evidence, knew how to like, kind of dig into things. And he started looking at the Christian faith because his wife had recently become a believer and he wanted to prove her wrong. This is not good advice, husbands, by the way. Don't, don't do this. But anyway, so Strobel examines the historical documents, he interviews scholars, and he really looks at Jesus and the resurrection from all kinds of different angles. Uh, and one of the things that he points out that always sort of stuck with me is this argument about the disciples. And he said this, so all but two of the original disciples died uh, proclaiming that they had seen the resurrected Christ. So you think about the 12 to begin with, right? How many fingers do I hold up here? 12. Uh, Judas hung himself, and John was given the job of taking care of Mary, Jesus' mother. So there are 10 left. What tradition tells us is that all 10 of the remaining disciples went to their deaths proclaiming that Jesus had been raised from the dead. And what Strobel argues is this. He says, now, we all know that somebody will die for something that they believe to be true, right? We see this all the time, that somebody will die for something they believe to be true. He said, but how many people will die for something they know to be a lie? Now, remember, all 10 of these guys, uh, one was beheaded, uh, one was sawed in half. There's terrible stories. Uh, one, one was hung on a cross upside down. Uh, that all of them went to their deaths saying, no, no, Jesus was raised from the dead and we saw it with our own eyes. And this is Strobel's argument from a sort of evidence perspective. He says, you would think that one of them, when the axe was hanging over his head, when that final blow was about to be dealt, that one of them would have said, psych! We made it up! We didn't really mean it, but not a single one of them did. And this is what he says. Now, when you've got 11 credible people with no ulterior motives, with nothing to gain and a lot to lose, who all agree that they observed the same thing with their own eyes, now you've got something that is difficult to explain away. So anyway... Strobel uh, kind of goes through all the evidence, and, and what he discovers is that his atheism doesn't stand up, and so he too becomes a believer. So if you're interested in this, I do recommend the book, and it's called The Case for Christ, and if you're not a reader, there is a movie about it that came out in 2017. So did you know that your body is made up of some 37 trillion cells and that those cells are constantly being replaced and renewed in a process called cellular regeneration. It's, it's pretty amazing when you think about it. So, you know, your, your, your skin cells are, are constantly falling off. And what scientists tell us is that your entire body, just about your entire body, replenishes and replaces itself every 7 to 10 years years, right? So here's some bad news about that. Oh, you know all that dust and stuff that kind of gathers around your house? That's you. It is. It's you. It's, it's your cells and everything kind of sloughing off, right? Uh, this also reminded me of something else I heard once. This is a great truth about life. It says this, skin cells die, hair cells die, brain cells die. But fat cells must have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior <laughs> because they live forever. Okay, but anyway, through this process of cellular regeneration, your body is replaced every seven to ten years. So think about it. It's like this, this cell dies and it's replaced by another one. This cell dies, it's replaced by another one, right? Uh, we are really, in a lot of ways, experiencing little deaths all the time, but we're also experiencing new life all the time. Now, if the same God who created the, this miraculous body that we have that's constantly replenishing itself, if the same God who created that and that process um, can't that same God also revive us at some point in time in the future? Don't you think it's possible? 
You think it's possible? I think it is. Um, but, but anyway, as I said earlier, uh, when dealing with questions of life after death, uh, when dealing with resurrection, uh, this idea of resurrection, what we ultimately believe is a, is a matter of faith. I can't, can't prove it to you. Can't prove that it does exist. Can't prove that it doesn't exist. Which brings me to what I want to ask you to consider this Easter. If believing or not believing are equally a choice, okay, again, I can't prove it to you one way or the other. Um, if believing in resurrection really is a matter of faith, which is the better choice? Which is the more joy-filled choice? Which is the more hope-filled choice? So I'll never forget the time that I uh, went out to coffee with a man whose wife, who he loved dearly, had passed away from cancer. And the cancer had come on very suddenly, and she had passed away very suddenly, and he was devastated and, and grieving. Uh, and while I was talking to him, I came to discover that he, he wasn't a believer. He didn't believe in Jesus. He didn't believe in life after death. He didn't believe in resurrection. Uh, and he was incredibly sad about the loss of his wife, as you can imagine. So in the course of our conversation, uh, I asked him this question. I said, let me ask you something. I said, how would it feel what would it be like for you if you did believe, uh, if you really did believe that somehow there is life beyond this life and that through the grace of God you might one day be reunited with your wife beyond this life? And you could see as he thought about it for a minute, his face kind of lit up a little bit, and he said, that would be wonderful. And I said to him, I said, then why would you deny yourself that joy? Think about it. It's a choice to believe or not to believe. It's a choice. Why would you deny yourself the joy of that faith? Good question, right? And he, just, he says, well, he goes, I just can't believe. And, and you saw the kind of light just leave, his, leave his face and leave him. It's a choice that we make. Now, on the flip side, I read recently about a Christian man who lost his very young son in a tragic accident. Uh, and if you can imagine the, the terrible pain of that. But th this was a Christian family, and they decided, asked their pastor if they could hold his memorial service on Easter Sunday. And so, uh, and so they did. And the father got up before that crowd on that Easter, and he, he shared that this year in particular, Easter had taken on a new power and meaning for him. He said this, until you stare death in the eye, Easter is just a word. It's a nice day with bunny rabbits and eggs. But when someone precious to you dies, Easter becomes everything. An anchor in a fierce storm, a rock on which to stand, a hope that raises you above despair and keeps you going. Right? Again, given the choice. Which is the better choice? Which is the more hope-filled choice? Which is the more joy-filled choice? Now, it's important for us to know that Jesus' resurrection is not just about life after physical death. It is certainly about that. And that is a huge question that we have as human beings, right? What happens when we die? What happens when our loved ones die? Uh, but the resurrection is about much more than that. See, Christians believe that resurrection is what God has planned for the whole of creation. See, this world is not as God created it to be. Can I get an amen? amen. Just look at the news. Look at, your, look at yourself sometimes. It's not the way God created it to be. But we as Christians believe that one day it will be. That just as in Jesus, life conquered death, so we believe that one day, peace will conquer war. Unity will conquer division. Plenty will conquer poverty. Health will conquer sickness. You get the idea? Justice will conquer injustice. What would you add to the list? Frederick Buechner famously says, Easter means that the worst thing is never the last thing thing. And it's this resurrection faith uh, that gives us Christians hope for the future. It's this resurrection faith that gives us Christians our marching orders, by the way, uh, the courage to work for a better world now, uh, to live out the prayer that we prayed not too long ago, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, where? On earth, 
as it is in heaven. Well, where do we get that idea from? Uh, It's this resurrection faith, to make it really personal, that gives me the courage that when I look at the dark and difficult things in my life, that I can kind of look them in the eyes and say, you don't get the last word. Uh, And I want to kind of ask you to think about that for a moment. Is there some dark, difficult thing that you're facing in your life right now? If there isn't, you're probably not human. But maybe you're going through a good patch right now. Maybe there's somebody else that you can think of, a loved one who's going through a hard or a difficult time. Maybe it's grief on this Easter day. Maybe it's just looking at the world in in general and going, ugh. Right? What would happen if you looked at all that darkness, all that sin, all that brokenness, and this is kind of the way I look at it, and you thumbed your nose at it and you said, you don't get the last word. Now, I realize that believing all of this is pretty fantastic, but here's what I've realized. Maybe fantastic is exactly what the doctor ordered. Maybe part of being saved is letting go of our limited view of who we are and what life is and surrendering ourselves to God's grand resurrection story. So in in 2016, I was privileged to travel to the Holy Land, Uh, and while I was in Jerusalem, we went to a place called the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and this is a place that tradition says sort of some of the last events of Jesus' life took place. But inside the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, there's a small chapel, uh, and inside that chapel is the place that it is believed uh, was Jesus' tomb. So it's the place where Jesus' body was laid. Uh, and I remember you're kind of in this space, and there's all this, uh, this uh, kind of like history around you, and there's this holy energy around you. And uh, when you go into this small chapel where Jesus' tomb is, you kind of have to duck down. They do it on purpose. You have, you have to kind of like kneel and bend a little bit when you go into that space. But inside that space, there's a marble slab, probably about the size of this altar table right in front of me. And it's under that marble slab that they say is the place where Jesus' body was laid. And I just kind of stood there as any of you would, kind of going, wow, this is the place. This is the place that tradition says Jesus' body was laid. Now, there, of course, is another part of my brain that's going, is this really the place? Is this really? But it's as, good a, it's as good a place as any other. I mean, this, this is it, they say. I said, okay, this is, this is where Jesus' body was laid. Now, if you all know me a little, if you know me, I'm a little slow sometimes. And if you don't believe me, ask my wife. She'll tell you he's a little slow sometimes. But, so I'm sitting there saying, all right, so this is where Jesus' body was laid. And then it hit me. If this is the place that Jesus' body was laid, then this is also the place, what? That he was raised, that he got up. And I'm telling you, something inside me just went, oh my, oh my gosh, this is the place. And then a voice in my head asked this. Y'all ever have that, by the way? Am I crazy? Okay. (laughs) So this voice inside my head said, come on, Brady. Do you really believe that? And I will tell you this, I, I, I was a professing Christian at the time. I was a pastor, and I, and I believed in the resurrection. But there was something about being in that place, in that space, and in that time, and saying, this is the spot that that question hit me in a whole new way. And I really did kind of ponder, Brady, do you really believe this? And I answered. I felt like I had to answer the question. And I stood there and I said, yes. I do. I believe that on the third day, Jesus was raised from the dead. Uh, And in that moment, uh, I will say to you, this sort of unspeakable joy kind of filled me. Because if that is true, then it is also true that darkness and sin and death do not have the final word. God has the final word. Life has the final word. Love has the final word word. And I'm going to tell you, I believe that. And what I want to ask you this Easter is this. What do you believe? What do you believe? If if it ultimately is a, a, a matter of faith, right? I can't prove you. I can't prove it to you one way or the other. But if it's ultimately a choice that we make, what choice do you make? What do you believe? 
Christ is risen. He is risen Christ is risen. He is risen Alleluia. Would you stand as together we affirm our faith? Will you join me in these historic words? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. take your seats. Will you turn, share the love, peace, and resurrection joy with your neighbors? As we prepare to take up our morning offering, uh, I just want to bring a couple of things to your attention. Uh, There is an attendance pad at the end of each one of your pews, this little blue folder. If you could find that and pass that down your row. Inside, you'll find a slip of paper that says, Connect With Us. If you would take just a minute, uh, we'd like to know that you're here in worship. Uh, If you're visiting, I offer you a very special welcome. We're really glad that you came to celebrate this Easter with us. And if you would give us a a little uh, information as you fill out that Connect With Us uh, form, give us an email address, 
some way that we can reach out to you. We just really want to be able to say welcome. And if you should have any questions about the life of the church, we'd love to be able to answer those too. You'll also find prayer request cards in the pews in front of you. If you have a prayer request, we invite you to fill one of those out. Those can either go into the offering plate or you can bring them and share them at the altar rail here during our closing hymn. And uh, I need to make sure that people, anybody watching online, uh, there's connect with us links and there's prayer request links and we invite you to participate in those as well. Uh, I have realized over the last year or so, I'm probably a little slow on this, that not very many people carry cash and checks anymore, and so we're passing these offering plates around. I want to make sure you know that there is an electronic option for giving, so there's a QR code in your bulletin and on your screens, um, and there are some uh, very uh, convenient ways to give there, ways that we've all become familiar with, PayPal, Venmo, Apple Pay, and all that, so if you'd like to give a gift that way, I just want to make sure you know that that is an option. So uh, our mission as a church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world, and we really do want to help you uh, to grow in your faith and practice as a follower of Jesus. And so there's all kinds of opportunities listed in our bulletin, uh, ways uh, you can engage in learning, in worship, in service. I hope you'll take note of those and that you'll participate in them. Also want to make sure you know that we have a resource table. It's just outside this door. It's on my left, and if you kind of hang a left. Uh, and on that table, you'll find a, a couple of great resources. Sources. One is a book called The Good and Beautiful God that talks about basics of the Christian faith and Christian practice. There's a wonderful book there that talks about uh, the Bible and, and uh, explores a lot of questions that people have about the Bible. And then there's also a book there on the United Methodist Church, who we are, what we believe. And I want to invite you, uh, if you're interested in any of those, to take one of those resources with you this morning. Uh, if you love it, keep it. If you want to, pass it off to somebody else. And when you're finished with it, if you want to, bring it back here and then and someone else can take it, but uh, they are there for you. And with those things said, I'll uh, invite our ushers to come forward as we take up our offering, and as they come, I invite you to bow your heads with me in prayer. Gracious God, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you have given us immeasurable joy and hope and grace. Lord, may these offerings that we give now reflect the grace that we have received. And may they reflect our commitment to serving and loving the risen Lord with our whole lives. Lord, bless this offering and all that it allows us to do. And it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
Go forth in joy to love and serve God in all you do. We are saved in the name of the Christ. Let us bless our Lord. May the God of peace, who raised to life the great shepherd of the sheep, make us ready to do his will in every good thing, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia.